All right, everybody, welcome back. Once again, Jurassic here with another replay. Today, we're going to be looking at a loss, and we're going to be talking about why the enemy team's movements and overall gameplay are counter to what we're trying to do. So in a lot of games, you're going to be hero countered. You're going to have a bad lane, or there's going to be some hero matchup in the mid game that you don't like for a multitude of reasons. But there's another philosophy in Dota when talking about counters that usually refers to how you play the map. Now this is something that is very hard for people to understand because they usually only perceive the game through what their own character is capable of doing and not necessarily what the enemy team wants to happen in a certain amount of time. So we're going to be looking at the perspective of a Wraith King. Uh, this is Ame for those who are unfamiliar. Now again, he does lose this game, but I want to start off by saying that he was last picked. I believe his pick was pretty solid for the game. They kind of needed a frontline hero, someone to absorb damage, take hits, so that the other heroes on his team could reliably get their spells off, and Wraith King kind of fits that bill. So, when we're talking about map movement, basically what it means is that during any given stage in the game, one team will have an advantage over the other in certain scenarios. So, for example, if your Wraith King's level 6, and you have Reincarnation, and they try to go on him, then obviously that guy is going to be really hard to take down because you have to kill him twice. This is like a super basic example. But the kind of stuff that we're going to be seeing in this game is more based around what part of the map Ame wants to be in versus the enemy team reading that movement and saying, this is the place where he will feel safe, this is where we want to go, and we want to kill him. And we're just going to start the replay. It's, it's on times two speed, but don't worry about it. We're not really like, we're not overly focused on the laning phase right now. He's going to be autoing a lot because he wants to shove the wave and he doesn't really want to be towards the lane at this stage because it's already six and a half minutes and usually by that time you're going to see like rotations, right? So what's the first thing that you notice by looking at the minimap is that the Shadow Shaman had just died, right? Now his positioning is based on the six minute rune which he was probably looking for and trying to secure for the mid player and he ends up dying. So at this point he pre-skills his second point into mortal strike now this obviously increases your farm rate but it does leave you susceptible to getting ganked because we don't have any points into reincarnation now the enemy team could make like a 50 50 guess on if he allocated this or not but honestly if you just held the point it would overall be a better play because you could theoretically set up for a counter initiation right so if you're unsure you hold the point you wait if they gank you and you're right next to your outpost or next to a tier one you allocate it then you respawn, then you fight them. This is probably what you would say is a, a touch on the greedy end. So, he's farming jungle, and the enemy team just killed his Shadow Shaman less than a screen away, right? He died basically where the sentry is on the minimap, the top one, if you can see it by mid. And then immediately after that, they just do a, a very, very quick movement into the enemy jungle. They see top is pushed to the tier one. Now, counter movements typically revolve around a few things. Wards, as in where is your vision? Creep equilibrium. Where are the waves relative to what heroes are showing? And then who wants farm and who doesn't want farm? Right? So that's the three things. The farm priority, the vision that you have, and where the creeps are. These are the three biggest factors in determining where the enemy team is going to be at any given point. So if we look at top and we see that it's pushed into the tier one, we see Viper showing on a creep wave mid, which the wave is also kind of like normalized, and bottom is also near the tier 1. Then that means that there's really only two spaces on the entire map that Ame could theoretically occupy, right? Just deduce that from what we can see just on the minimap. So when the enemy team makes this move, they could have a ward, right? They could very easily have a ward on this location and walk in here, but what's more likely is the mag said that the Wraith King was not in lane, and then the two heroes that were nearest to the point where the jungle is, after having killed the hero, said, hey, a hero's showing, two waves are pushed into a tier one, let's try to make a movement into the jungle and see who we find. And lo and behold, they find Ame, and I believe he'll die here. Yeah, it's just three heroes. So he dies. He's gonna ping the cliff, assuming that there's a ward. Now, this is a an assumption that a lot of people make. Like, I make this assumption a lot. You see an aggressive move, you assume, hey, there's probably a ward here. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it was just intuitive 
for them to make that move because they were already so close anyway. Like, there's no real downside for them walking up that hill. There's pretty low chance that you're going to be, like, walking into anything super scary. So the next move that he makes is he TPs to the bottom lane. Now, when you're feeling very uncomfortable or you feel like there's something that is providing vision in the area of the map that you want to occupy, your first instinct is to be as far away from that place as possible. So he dies in the jungle. And then because he dies in the jungle and he pings the cliff and he says, hey, there's a ward here, the next step for him is to go bottom because he has two heroes standing in front of him and there's a buffer between him and the enemy team if people were to make their way in this direction. Now, they also have a Beastmaster, so they're going to have, like, Hawk Vision and things like that too. But what the enemy team wants is to pressure, right? Like, they have the, this Witch Doctor, Lena, Wind Ranger. These heroes are very good at playing aggressive. And Dyer's heroes aren't terrible at killing but obviously Ame needs some time he's going for a super greedy build he's going Midas so treads into Midas into potentially another item like Radiance he doesn't want to fight and he especially doesn't want to fight because he doesn't have reincarnation and because the enemy team killed him once at level six and he didn't respawn they can probably assume that he still doesn't have it you know as long as he doesn't hit seven or eight So he walks in, he finds a nice little kill here, or maybe not kill, okay, yeah there we go, he gets the kill. So this play by Ame is, is pretty sound because he knows his Beastmaster is 6, he knows that he can't really be top on his own, and it's usually better to play the enemy team's safe lane than your own after like, I would say sometimes even 5 or 6 minutes. The offlane hero gets very strong. In this case, it was a mag and a wind ranger lane. Wraith King obviously can't pressure either of these heroes. He can't summon his skeleton. So the only logical conclusion that he can come to in this game is that being top is not useful. If he summons the skeletons, they die to the mag. He has cleave, he has shockwave. Wind ranger can kill them. Both the heroes have escapes and he can only melee. So playing on that side of the map for him just doesn't make sense because best case, they, they have a bunch of heroes come to his own safe lane and then kill a guy. And then immediately after that, they all have to rotate back to their respective parts on the map. And they've given up control of potentially two different spots on the map to do that. So when you're looking at this move in isolation, it's very easy to say, oh yeah, he just TP'd bottom because, well, his heroes were there and he felt safe. That is true. But it's also true that spending time in your safe lane when it's very hard to defend can often be a liability to your team. So you really want to try to avoid those types of situations whenever you can it's okay to let the tier one die if it's not worth the investment of defense because you'll end up just giving more kills and then eventually losing the tower anyway it's usually better to just be here at least in this example so i have not watched the entirety of this replay but i do know that this game ends up being a loss we're just going to try to look very objectively at what things happen within the game as far as what the enemy team does that result in us not being able to win. And it's, I think it's more useful sometimes to look at it from the losing team's perspective so you can get an understanding of how it's going to feel in a game when these things are happening to you. So he's still working his way towards Midas. They get the bottom tier one. He's always spending time basically in between his other heroes when he's farming at this point because he doesn't feel safe. So this little, little movement that happened, the top lane going on the clockwork and the mid lane going on the mag, this I would say is probably actually favored for Dyer because they're pressuring the tier 1 and the mid lane. They get a kill on an off lane whereas they trade a support. In a lot of games, especially high-level games, it's very common for the 4 or the 5 hero to occupy the space that is not defendable. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but the reason why a hero like Clockwork or a hero like Shadow Shaman would be top is because they can stall for an amount of time that actually has consequence. Like, if the tower stays alive for another 90 seconds because the 4 or the 5 was there, they get a wave and a half of EXP, maybe two waves of EXP, whatever then they're buying time, whereas their contribution on the map in other places is just not sufficient. So a non-level 6 Shadow Shaman or a non-level 6 Clockwork 
have a very hard time making moves on this map currently. Just due to the heroes that Radiant have, Clockwork really wants Hook, Shaman really wants Wards, and their time can be better spent in another location. So in this case, the Clockwork is top. His death is not super impactful for Radiant. They're not psyched to kill a position 4. It's just a little added bonus. And because mid and bottom are both being simultaneously pressured due to Mag's death, they have to immediately respond to all this pressure that's happening. There are skeletons on the tier 2 bottom. There are heroes in the mid lane under the T1. Right now, the Morphling can continue to push top, which is fine. But the overall resource allocation on the map for this point in time, I would say favors Dire. So I'm curious to see where it goes. Yeah, Dire even get a D ward. They're still occupying the enemy jungle. The Clockwork is still hanging top. He's still trying to get EXP. Now, Ame's farming pattern now is very... It's very, very common in games where you have to sacrifice your own safe lane. This type of movement, like enemy jungle to your own triangle, this is all very, very standard. Okay, so he TPs to top, and I believe it got cancelled. Let's go back and check, actually. Yeah, okay, he got, he got hit by a cast. So his TP gets cancelled. He wanted to be top. Now that TP, ca uh, TP cancel is actually fairly big. Because it means now that Ame not only does not have a TP, but he wasn't able to be in the place that he wanted to be. So what happened as a result of the Witch Doctor throwing one cask is that he lost the Clockwork again. The tower took a lot of damage. And the Morphling is going to be able to most likely rotate away from this situation. And he's on the more advantageous spot on the map. So from a philosophical standpoint when you're playing Dota, normally the aggressive move, if you can do it correctly, is always the best move. A lot of people end up getting scared and they like don't want to cross the river and they don't want to try to apply any of their own pressure because they are afraid of dying. So in Dota, just as a, an objective truth, not all deaths are bad. In fact, sometimes dying, depending on how many heroes react or what happens as a result of your death, can be very good for your team, especially when you are behind. There is a saying, if you're behind, take more risk. What that means is, if you play a static part of the map, and you are just sitting in your triangle, and sitting in your own jungle, and you never make any movement to try to pressure the opponents, they are much less likely to make a mistake. And since you're already behind, and you have less map control, you are giving them more resources to continually control the game. So imagine, for the sake of argument, that right now, you know, Dire controls 50% of the map and Radiant control 50% of the map. If that ever changes based on a team fight, and say it skews towards Radiant like 70%, and then Dire have 30% over the course of 5, 8, 10 minutes, that advantage gets bigger and bigger. Even if there are no kills happening, the advantage gets bigger because there are less places that you feel safe to occupy. So if you're in a game and you're behind, making aggressive moves is best. Like that Witch Doctor walking into the enemy triangle is an aggressive move. He might have assumed there was a ward there, but he makes, you know, the incursion up the ramp, which is a little bit scary. Sure, walking up ramps is tough sometimes. He finds Ame TPing. He cancels the TP. And then they get a kill and tower pressure and map control because of a single TP cancel. If Ame is up here, there's no way the clockwork di uh, dies. Like, the, the Morphling is not going to dive him if there's a hero right there. So just this one little thing, like one little movement from Witch Doctor, ends up being a lot of stuff. Looks like the Morphling is actually going to die anyway. Okay, cool. So they do get him. I didn't think they would kill him, but I guess he used his wave farm aggressively. But fact remains that it was a nice move from the Witch Doctor. Ame is still hanging out in his triangle. Let's go ahead and change the net worth. Now, I don't want to talk too much about item builds here because... I feel like in the grand scheme of things, Ame's build is fine. He is the hard carry, as in his other two heroes don't really scale that well. Like, Viper scales in a pretty mediocre way, and Beastmaster is, is kind of in the same vein. So he goes for, like, the maximum impact scaling late game uh, focus Wraith King build. 
which I think is okay. Also notice that he is playing. Th this is actually another point that we can make really quick. And this isn't necessarily to do with just strictly counters. But notice his skill build in his inventory. And notice how he's playing the game. He's not going to team fights. His team walked right next to him and smoked. And he said, I don't have reincarn. I don't have an item to fight with. I'm just not going to fight. As the one player, it's very important a lot of the time to make the distinction of when you can and when you cannot battle. And the easiest way to do that is to look at your skill build and look at your items and ask yourself, does it make sense if I go to a team fight with no reincarnation into their triangle and no other item in my inventory besides Midas treads? The conclusion that you're going to come to is most likely, no, it doesn't make sense. If he had reincarn, he might have gone in the smoke. That is a possibility. But his gameplay is a reflection of the things that he has in his inventory and the way he's allocated his skill points. I don't know why, but a lot of 1s, 2s, 3s, these types of players, they will build items and then play completely contradictory to what their inventory is saying that they should be doing. So in Ame's case, he goes, yep, I bought some farming items, I'm going to farm. Now his team's okay with that, they're off making moves on the map, they get a couple of the kills. Ends up being a trade. But the important thing to note here is that the place that Ame is occupying on the map is still an advantage. And even though he is farming, he's still applying counter pressure because he can go bottom, he can summon skeletons, he can push the wave, and after the fight ends top, the enemy team will be forced back as opposed to being able to take an objective after the fact. So he's still using his time efficiently and he's still farming in what you would call a an aggressive manner because he's taking the enemy jungle farm and he's very close to being able to rotate to bottom. So he summons the skeletons, he leaves. I'm actually kind of curious as to when he's going to get reincarnated. Alright, so he hit 11. Uh, he put a second point into his stun. I must say, I know Ame is a very, very good carry player, but I am a tad bit stumped by this uh, particular skill build. I'm, my guess right now is that he feels that there's no point in him attending a fight until he has Radiance, and if that's the case, he'll probably have level 2 Reincarn. Yeah, okay, he just double skilled it there. Alright, he's got a Relic. It all makes sense now. I was going to say, he's probably just holding it for when... Uh, when he actually has the item in his inventory to be able to fight. So the enemy team still playing pretty aggro, just trying to buy Morphling all the space that he needs. And Morphling is actually able to play quite forward this game also because there there is some catch, but unless he gets shackled or roared, it's still quite difficult for Dyer to kill him without the the multiple CC effects on the one hero. Warplang is pretty elusive after all, and not the best matchup for Wraith King. So he's got his item. I'm assuming that if there's another movement, he is going to be involved in that movement. This is the stage in the game where you look at the hero and you say, okay, I am adequately strong. We're going to have a nice little fight here. Here, quick shot. So Ame's farm is still very good. He's uh, highest in the game right now by a little bit. He didn't have to use Reincarn there. Now, if we're looking at the enemy team, like obviously this game is still very close. We know for a fact that the game ends up being a loss, so we can only really theorize what really goes wrong. But I would say from the way that Ame played this game, even though he did die twice, his overall gameplay made a lot of sense, at least to me. 
like where he where he chose to be on the map, his item build, his role in the game, you know, waiting until he had the adequate items to farm, like all this stuff adds up pretty well. I don't actually think the enemy team did a super great job at pressuring his farm. They did take the towers. It's so like mid tier one is dead, safe lane tier one is dead. They they created a decent amount of pressure on the map, but they couldn't really find Ame that often. Now, a lot of this is due to the way the map is currently designed. It is pretty hard to like walk up hills blind and, and find a carry farming and just kill him. So maybe the, the current best way to go about it is just to take the towers and just occupy the enemy side and wait for your opportunity based on vision or a smoke or something like that. So for now, uh, we haven't really come to the, the reason why the game is lost, but I know the game is not super long, so we will likely see something that leads us to that end relatively soon. As far as itemization goes, this is maybe the first choice he's made that I'm a little bit skeptical of. He's gonna get caught here. He's baiting himself with the rain card. Okay, he ends up dying. So let's let's uh, slow it down a bit. So what happens here? His team's nearby. Viper is not around. Let's see if Viper has travels. He does. So he gets caught by an LSA. He gets maledicted straight up. Oh, no, wait, I think that's just a graphical bug. Yeah, it is. Okay, now he gets maledicted. He's pretty much dead here no matter what. So here is the first point where we can definitively say that this is not a good thing to do. Right? So if we think about the logic of what happens, he obviously wants to cancel the ward, but... By committing to this stun, you're basically saying, I'm dead, right? Maybe he thinks he's dead either way. Maybe he is dead either way. And the Morphling doesn't have waveform, but he does have uh, Morph, so he'd be able to turn into him regardless. So maybe he's dead either way. Maybe the mistake here in the first place is uh, actually not the way the fight starts, but more the way that the team counter initiated. So this is the first fight in the game where we look at it and we go, okay, this is pretty bad. Like the way the fight started. I believe that as soon as he gets pulled out of position like that, there's probably not a lot the rest of his team can do to save him because there's just so many stuns. So maybe not having adequate vision, maybe being too far forward based on the positioning of the map. Like, there is still a tier 1 there. Like, pushing the tower, having the reincarn ready to go, radiance in the inventory, all this stuff. Sometimes the enemy team just outfights you or outpositions you. And I feel like that was just the case there. If anything, maybe the clockwork cooked in too quickly. He hooked in too quickly and then got caught by the RP and then skewered so he couldn't get a better hook later. Essentially, like, the clockwork committed too quickly after seeing the, them going on the Wraith King, perhaps. But even though the fight was pretty bad in terms of who was traded, it's not like... The Wraith King didn't necessarily fall that far behind in terms of farm. He's still the highest in the game. The one one team fight is not really the make or break here. Something else definitely goes wrong. They're still occupying a pretty good spot on the map, waiting for the creeps to respawn. Hopefully Clockwork doesn't block the camp. Yeah, I'm just kind of scratching my head about the SNY. I understand that there's RP, but I'm wondering if you can get away with not having a DKB here. I feel like BKB might be more necessary. <laughs> I 
And for now, it looks like it's just gonna be more farming. So we're gonna we're gonna speed it up a little bit. We don't just wanna watch on one X if he's gonna hit some creeps. Most people kind of know how to hit creeps. Let's try to find something that happens. Looks like you lost someone oh, here, mate. Some DCs. Okay. Just gonna fast forward past this as well. But the the thing about the enemy lineup that counters the Wraith King so hard is that they have a lot of uh, heroes that stand in the back. And I know I haven't really talked at length about what exactly is countering the Wraith King in this game, but I could sum it up as this. Wraith King is best when heroes die within his stuns, or the enemy team does not have enough mobility and damage to kill him two times. So with the way the fight started top, he got pulled very far out of position, and it was essentially like a 4v1 or a 5v1 until the rest of his team got there. Then when he respawns, he's just a normal carry with one life. So that ends up being a fight where he, his ultimate is kind of nullified because he was initiated on in a way before his team could reliably help him. But outside of that, heroes like Morphling, Windranger, Mag, these heroes are built-in escape mechanisms. Like you have Windrun, you have Skewer, you have Waveform. Morphling can turn into you as Wraith King and also stun you and just Waveform away. So as far as core matchups, these are not particularly good for Wraith King. But I believe the reason why he picked the hero regardless based on matchup is because he felt like he, his team needed more frontline and more chaos within the fight so that they would have a chance to use their abilities Here better. Some games you're going to be on teams like this where it's just like a lot of very aggressive, like stun fighty type heroes. And you're not going to have a good option for like a Medusa or some kind of late game superiority pick because you're playing into Mag, you're playing into Lina, you're playing into Windranger. These heroes are all pretty decent anti-carry. So sometimes it's best to just lean into the, the battle aspect and just try to, to win that way, and I kind of think that's what he was going for here. But regardless, the later the game goes, the harder the matchups are going to get, for him in particular. Yeah, Alright, so our pause time. is done. I believe the enemy team is going to smoke. Yep, there it is. So, a very quick smoke movement after a pause. Okay, so here he's just, it's just out of position, right? Like, we see one hero showing mid. There was a pause. Nothing's really happening on the map. There are no aggressive wards, I don't think. Let's double check. Yeah, there aren't any. But they smoke up, they find him. And again, he's just going to die. So, so far, the the thing that the enemy team is doing right in this game is they're finding Ame in times where his team cannot help him. So this is, let's say this is the first really bad thing that happens. Not really looking at the lane death because that one didn't matter too much. The top death was like, it was more or less a trade and the trade didn't necessarily benefit one team massively over the other. Still bad for Wraith King to die, obviously, but not... Not so bad that the dynamic of the game shifts. So at this point, this death is very, very painful. And it's mostly painful because it's going to make it so that the enemy team can get Roche. So the play that the enemy team makes is saying, hey, we get a pick, we go Roche. They're making the choice to say, if we're together at this stage and they're not, we kill them. And then once we kill them, we get Roche. And then the next fight for us becomes free. Now, why is it important that the fight after this one is good for Radiant is because if they're bridging the gap between when their te their lineup is weaker, which it is invariably weaker early game as opposed to late game. Late game Morphling is an absolute monster against these heroes. Very hard to deal with. So if they get a good pick and that pick results in Roche, then they have more leeway, I guess you could say, in getting to that point where the Morphling is just going to be too much. Now, he might already be close to that point because he does have the bonus damage from Mag and stuff and a, uh, a bunch of really nice follow-up spells and stuns. But this kill, if you're looking at the game and you're just watching, you go, oh, okay, they killed the Wraith King and they got Roche. But really, this is a gigantic problem because Dyer's team is committal. They are all in, all the time. Shadow Shaman's all in, Clockwork is all in, Viper is all in, Beastmaster is all in. You cast your spells, that guy has to die. If that guy doesn't die, the fight is going poorly for you. So taking this Roche basically removes the ability for Dyer to fight until that Aegis is gone. Very, very impactful kill. Mine. 
So he's pinging again. I think there's a word. I do not believe there was. Okay, so they're going to go for a double smoke here. Now this, this is something really good that you can take note of. Notice like 10 seconds ago, we'll pause it right when, bam, right there. Look at how many heroes we see on the map. So this smoke movement happens as a premise of a map reset, which is basically the enemy team takes an objective, a couple heroes TP home to deal with their lanes. That is very loosely referred to as a map reset. When people have to go home to do shit and then... You know, they, they make a move maybe like 30 seconds after that. So you have this window where the enemy team is going to be spread out. They're not going to be together. This is a very important time to utilize, especially if you're behind. The enemy team is going to be strongest as five. Your team is going to be strongest as five. So when you can tell that the enemy team is not together and you're behind, then their net worth lead doesn't matter. Because the net worth and the experience lead only matter if the heroes are together. So this is a situation where the smoke could result in a kill that could, you know, force TPs or create some more map uh, map control for, for Dire. You know, who knows? We'll see what happens. All right, so the Windrider just bails. Doesn't want to be a part of this. So they get some better positioning on the map. The Windranger had a nice read. TP stop. But this is also... This is also the correct play just in general because if you're fighting into an Aegis, and this is also a very common thing that happens in a lot of pubs, okay? I can't even tell you how many times I've seen this happen, even in my own games. The enemy team gets Roshan. Multiple core players are sitting in their base behind a tier 3 tower waiting for the creeps and waiting for the enemy team to start pushing. The key word here is waiting. You know what really sucks to do in Dota? Waiting. Waiting for creeps to spawn, waiting for the enemy team to make a move. Just any sort of non-actionable thing that's going on inside of the game is bad. Kill that habit. Go and make a move somewhere else. If the enemy team has Roche and you can't defend your tier 2, there is no reason to be there. If the enemy team has Roche and they're poking a tier 3, you put one or two heroes there that can stall. In this case, probably just the Viper, because he's the only one with like legitimate wave clear, or beast, I suppose. And that hero stalls while you apply pressure somewhere else on the map. So what's going to happen is the Wraith King is going to push bottom. There's a Shadow Shaman down here, too. This means they have high structural damage. If the enemy team keeps pushing top with this Aegis, what's going to happen is the Shaman's going to drop wards in the Tier 3 and either force them home, or they're going to go for a trade. Now, a trade, when the enemy team has teamfight superiority, is usually considered a good thing because if you can't beat them in a fight, then the best possible thing that you can get is getting the same as they get. So in games where you're behind, if you're just sitting in the base and you're waiting for them, you're not getting this tower pressure, you're not getting any, any structural damage, you're not forcing the enemy team to do anything they don't want. You're just letting them play the game exactly the way they want to. And this is applicable at every bracket. Like, there's no point in Dota where this is not true. So, they're hitting some towers. Top lane's being pushed. We also know, by the way, that the Windranger can be down. So now look. The enemy team has to respond. So this Aegis that they've acquired is being pulled back to their base. It's hard to describe how valuable that is when you're actually playing the game, but just making the Aegis carrier TP home, it opens up everything. Like, that outpost that the enemy team just took in the jungle, you can go back and get that. You can reestablish control of your side of the map. Because now, they have to address you. You have made them come home by pressure. Alright, so this move actually ends up being pretty good, as long as Ame doesn't die. Alright, so they lost Clockwork. They're gonna get the outpost back, but overall this is still like pretty okay. And notice the Shaman, like mostly we're, we're, fo we're focused on Ame's perspective, the Shaman still has not left bottom. He understands that 
if this lane gets pushed out and top lane is at the base and mid lane is close to the base that the map becomes very hard to play at that point that's essentially like a choke where getting out of the base becomes more difficult and them getting from mid lane to top or mid lane to bottom is very very quick in comparison to having to run the entire distance of the map obviously so we really want to try to avoid that situation from happening enemy team runs straight back to the jungle gonna force on my back they re-establish control of the outpost but here still they are split So let's go back and let's see where it was good and exactly where it turned bad. So here are the Witch Doctors that there is a tier one in the top lane still, 27 minutes in tier one. Pretty pretty bad. Right here. Right here, it's very good. If we just leave right now, we are super happy with the situation. This is the point, because like the cogs are separating everybody from the fight. You know, we got four people on the right hand side they can't walk through this we just walk up the hill we're all good you know the witch doctor bought back we know he bought back because he pretty much immediately did so after the mag went in we just take that we take the buyback we cut you know the loss which is probably going to be shadow shaman we're good but this and the fight is now a disaster literally just moving from this little spot on the hill to moving here has turned this fight from a win into a literal catastrophe. Because now they can't get out. And these heroes feel like they have to commit. Yeah. One little move. One little move turns the fight into a total cacophony of awfulness. Which is unfortunate too, because they spent quite a bit of time making some nice moves, and then they made one bad one. And now all of a sudden, it's real bad. Chat, what would, I, I know this is a video and everything, but I wanted to just ask my chat a quick question. What would you guys say if I said moving 400 units gave the enemy team a 10k net worth lead and a Rax? If I told anybody that, they'd be like, how? Right? Like, how, how does that one movement cause so many bad things to happen? And I mean, basically, it's just because Dota is a very butterfly effect game. You know, one small thing affects another thing, which affects another thing. And then it's just a domino effect until eventually the game becomes unwinnable, right? And normally in Dota, there's the idea that your draft only has a finite amount of mistakes that it can make before the game becomes unplayable. Now, the higher MMR you get, the amount of mistakes you make in general are less. But there will still be times where you make too many, and then the game is bad, right? You either bought a bad item, you picked a bad hero, you made a bad move, whatever. This game was actually very close until that fight inside of the jungle. And that fight inside of the jungle was also even worse because of the spot on the map that it took place in. So when you look at a game like this, and obviously, like, the whole subject of this video is, like, you know, what did the enemy team really do to counter us? And in, in fact, because I hadn't watched the game up until now, it's not really like the enemy team countered us too much other than one or two nice smoke moves. We actually kind of just made our own mistake in overcommitting to a team fight that we could not commit to. So we know that the later the game goes, the enemy team's going to have superior team fight, but in this particular case... It doesn't end up so much being that the enemy team countered what we were trying to do. It's more like we countered ourselves. And that happens all the time as well. So, I believe this is probably where the game gets a little bit out of hand. The replay doesn't have too much more time. So we're probably going to go ahead and just say that this is a good stopping point. Let's go to uh, see the base really quick. Yeah, they, they, they're they 10k behind. They do have some buybacks, but this is kind of cracking the egg in terms of the game and just due to hero matchup i don't really see how uh dire is going to be able to win this one but hopefully you guys learned a little bit 
about how the map movement works, about how moves can counter what the enemy team wants. Just always remember that there is a play that can be made within the game as long as you have other people who are willing to make the play with you. Sometimes you won't have that. Sometimes you will. But you always have to check. You know, you say, hey, let's smoke. Let's try to do this. You know, let's go rush. Let's push this. If you don't communicate any of these things and the other team is, then you're at a massive disadvantage inside of the game. Anyway, I hope you guys are all having a wonderful one. If you guys want to check me live, you can do it on twitch.tv slash Same as the YouTube. See you guys next time.